Welcome everyone to my third XCOM 2 War of the Chosen challenge run. You can check out my previous runs, Sparks only and Templars only, on this YouTube channel, so please give those a look if you're interested. And before we start, I just want to say at the time of recording this script, my Templars only video has almost 4,000 views. I know in the grand scheme of YouTube that's not a huge number, but the idea that 4,000 people were interested enough to check out my content is incredible. Thank you all so much for the support. I know content comes out slowly on this channel. Going forward, I'm going to have a lot more free time on my hands, and I'm planning to put out an XCOM video every couple of weeks come the new year. So please consider subscribing for more XCOM videos if you're interested. And with that out of the way, today I'm going to answer the question, can you beat XCOM 2 War of the Chosen using only Reapers in combat? Now Reapers' main focus is stealth. They live in deserted cities, dwelling in the shadows to avoid advent rule. They're basically Tom Clancy style super spies, just with aliens as the main part of their diet. They're pretty cool. They also have some pretty amazing abilities like Banish, Remote Start and Claymores. Not to mention their shadow ability which gives them a minuscule detection radius while they're concealed. They're almost invisible to the enemy. However, the biggest issue I'm expecting is going to be in the early game. Their vector rifles do one less damage than normal assault rifles, so taking out enemies could be tough initially. By the end of the game, I'm expecting we'll annihilate everything in our path. What's your prediction? Let me know in the comment section below. Before we begin, I do live stream these challenge runs on my Twitch channel, so if you're interested in seeing the entire playthrough for any of these videos, please give me a follow on Twitch. The link is in the description. And with that out of the way, let's check out the rules for this run. We're playing on Commander difficulty. We're playing on Honest Man, which means we can only reload a previous save in the event of misclicks or glitches. And we can obviously only use Reapers in combat. So beginning the run, I replace the 12 regular starting soldiers with 12 Reapers instead. The main problem we had with our Templar run is going to apply here too. The only way to get more soldiers is to recruit them via Covert Ops. So if we lose anybody to injury, or more permanently, <coughs> refilling the ranks is going to be a problem. We start at the Reaper HQ because anything else would be ridiculous, and we hit the first mission. Now, Gatecrasher has two pods on Commander difficulty. One pod has three troopers, and the other has two troopers and a captain. I did playtest this a couple of times, and the main thing that makes this mission trivially easy is if the pod with three troopers are standing close enough together that you can hit all of them with one claymore. Shooting the Claymore doesn't blow concealment, and it's guaranteed to take out the early game base troopers. And as you can see, our Claymore can indeed hit the whole pod. So we blow them to smithereens and continue on with all our soldiers still in concealment. Spoiler alert, that's going to be a recurring situation. Did I mention every Reaper has a Claymore, so we have three more to use for the next pod? Yeah, this mission is going to be a cakewalk. The Claymores do five damage, but the Captain has seven health. So, what do we do, whatever do we do? Well, we throw two claymores onto the pod, and we blow them to smithereens as well. So first mission is over, and the bad guys literally never even saw us. This is off to a really good start, but how long is that going to last? Well, I run into a potential problem pretty quickly. Without any upgrades, Reapers can't carry any utility items. That means no flashbangs if we get mind controlled, and no medikits if something goes wrong. So this could be interesting. At least it saves us some supplies not having to buy equipment. I start building the Guerrilla Tactics School late after initially forgetting to start any construction. A few small setbacks, but nothing to worry about too much. In the second mission we need to recover an item. We've only got 7 turns to do it and a lot of ground to cover, so I'm a little bit nervous. We use a Claymore on the first pod, but the Sectoid survives. We break concealment with one Reaper to finish it off, but the others are still concealed, so we push ahead. And we can actually go back into concealment once per mission too. So yeah, Reapers are pretty awesome. I burn through two more Claymores to take out a pod with a Trooper and a Sectoid. Advent also calls in reinforcements on us, and we've only got two turns to get to the item. 
This is going much worse than the first mission. I used the last claymore to take out a trooper, but the captain in the pod survives. We're running out of time, so my only choice is to start shooting. The first shot reapers take has only a 50% chance to blow their concealment, so I'm basically relying on the flip of a coin to keep our soldiers alive. And at the very first shot, we lose our concealment. The next shot also blows our concealment, and now it's time for the priest and two stun lancers to hit us back. The priest uses Holy Warrior to buff one of the stun lancers. The stun lancers then hit two of our troops with melee attacks. One loses an action point and the other falls unconscious. This is awful. We're able to grab the item on the last turn before it detonates, and we take out one stun lancer. Advent thankfully miss all their attacks on the next turn, so we get a brief reprieve. I take out the priest, and this causes the stun lancer to fall as well. One of the benefits of Holy Warrior. If the priest goes down, it takes the buffed unit with it. So we walk away with two wounds, but no casualties. Not a terrible outcome, but not a great one either. We would have been fine if it weren't for the reinforcements, but you can probably see now that missions with large enemy counts are going to be a problem, at least in the early game. Once we're out of claymores, our options become very limited at this point in the game. I start clearing some debris in the Avenger as it dawns on me that we need the infirmary as quickly as possible. Nothing too eventful happens for a little while until we get our first retaliation mission. The great part about Reapers is we always start off concealed, even on missions we wouldn't normally, including retaliation missions. Even better, saving civilians doesn't blow concealment. So we've saved three of the six civilians we need before we've even engaged any advent. This is a great start. But it gets even better. A sectoid and trooper take cover next to a car. We use Remote Start to detonate the car and one-shot them, and Remote Start doesn't even break concealment. And the civilian that was hiding near the car turned out to be a faceless, and we one-shot that too. This is amazing. The next pod also takes cover next to an explosive object, and we blow it sky high to one-shot them all as well. And here something interesting happens, and by interesting, I mean I kind of broke the game. See, that was the last alien pod, so the map is now clear of enemies. However, the game still wants to spawn in the Chosen, but can't do it because we haven't broken concealment. So we're just running around grabbing the remaining civilians for a while, before I decide to break concealment by running through a window. And if the level didn't have any doors or windows to break concealment on, we could have ended up being stuck in this mission forever, or evacing out and failing the mission, even though all enemies were defeated, and all civilians saved, which is kind of ridiculous to think about. Anyway, with one Reaper out of concealment, the Assassin spawns in, and in all three of these challenge runs, I've started with the Assassin every time. Not as bad as the Warlock in the early game, but still pretty bad. However, Jake Solomon does decide to take mercy on us today, as the Assassin takes extra damage from explosions. That's not going to end well for her. I could place the Reaper back into concealment, but I decide to leave him out as bait instead to draw the Assassin out. Yeah, I know, I'm a heartless commander. So the Assassin makes a very poor life choice at this point, and hides next to a car. I toss a Claymore onto her, and then use Remote Start on the car, and, well, you can see the results for yourself. It's not often I get to one-shot a Chosen, so I'm going to appreciate this moment. However, she did spawn in a trooper, so we have to take it out too, a claymore later, and it's easily done. After this mission, Bower is wounded for 25 days, which hurts, but Thomas gets Shredder as an ability, which is great. Chapurnov also gets tactical rigging, which lets him carry a utility item. This is going to give us some much needed flexibility, and it's actually a mandatory ability to have, as it's the only way we can equip the Skulljack when we need to. But between 12 Reapers, the chance of at least one person getting the ability was quite high, so I wasn't too worried about it. Next up, we get a really helpful resistance order that decreases our excavation time by 50%. I also launch a covert op to find the Templars. We can't use the Templars on the field, but we can make use of their HQ to heal our troops faster, which I think we're going to need, given how hard it is to replace troops 
when they're injured. We have another Gorilla Op, and you know what's even better than using a Claymore on a pod from Concealment? Using a Claymore on a pod standing on top of a destructible roof, because in addition to the Claymore damage, the enemies take fall damage as well. The Sectoid in this pod survives on 1 HP, which means we did 7 HP of damage while remaining concealed. That's pretty great. I take a shot to finish it off, and our Reaper does reveal. However, thanks to Shadow, we put her back into concealment on the next turn, and we continue on our way. And we actually stay in concealment all the way up until the last enemy on the map, which we promptly finish off as soon as it spots us. This mission went amazingly well. I purchased the first squad size upgrade after this mission, and we get another scientist. We also make contact with the Templars, but we immediately dismiss the soldier they gave us, as we can't use them in combat. Up next is our first supply raid, and the Lost are present. Now, between the Lost, Remote Start, and Claymores, I'm planning on remaining in concealment until Advent are mostly taken care of, but you know how it is, things don't always go to plan. We start off well, using Remote Start on a truck to take out a Viper and a couple of Lost, However, the purifier who survived the blast decides instead of attacking the lost standing literally right next to him, he's going to make a beeline right into where our reapers are hiding. Absolutely miserable luck. Now because he reveals two of our troops, one of their overwatch activates. I was pretty panicked here, expecting him to blow up right on top of our troopers when they fired at him. Luckily that didn't happen, so we get some good luck at least. However, the reveal does cause a nearby pod of a viper and trooper to activate, and it also causes the loss to hone in on us. Thankfully Chapurnov is still concealed, and he has the shrapnel ability. This buffs his claymores, causing them to do more damage and to have a bigger blast radius. This allows us to take out the Viper immediately, while maintaining concealment on him. Of course, the downside is all these explosions have attracted another Lost Pod. And the worst part is quite a few of them have 5 HP, and our guns are still only doing 3-4 to 4 damage. We spend a couple of turns fending off the Lost, but thankfully the surviving Trooper is doing the same, so his attention isn't on us. Once it's safe, we take out the trooper because the lost are doing a terrible job of it. We then clean up the remaining lost, and we're safe for now, but that purifier has really thrown a spanner into our plans. Putting some of our reapers back into concealment with shadow, we push forward, fighting off lost as we need to. I come across a pod of a captain and a trooper, and even better, they're standing next to a car. I have some pretty sinister plans involving that car and remote start for the next turn, but of course more loss show up before I can action it. This causes the captain and the trooper to activate and they scatter for cover nowhere near the car. We're getting really bad luck this mission. So at this point I've got 4 out of 5 reapers concealed, the new lost pod has swarmed around the car, and I do have the option of blowing it up. I decide not to so I can keep the lost alive, hopefully Advent will focus on them instead of our one revealed soldier. Well, that's exactly what happens, as the captain uses his grenade on the cluster of Lost. The best part about this is he now can't use the grenade on us. As there's no time limit on this mission, I opt to hang back and let Advent and the Lost fight it out, and it's really interesting to watch how less aggressive the Lost are against Advent compared to XCOM. At one point the Lost have the Captain literally surrounded, but only one of them actually attacks. Eventually the Lost thankfully take out the Trooper, while the Captain seems to disappear. And that's the price you pay for hanging back, I guess. We then start breaking concealment to clean up the Lost, which goes off without a hitch, despite us missing a few easy shots. But it wouldn't be XCOM if we weren't missing easy shots. We eventually track the Captain down, who is holding up inside a shack, we, well, you can see what we do. So we managed to take out 58 enemies with no injuries. The bad luck with the purifier did slow us down significantly, but we were never in any real danger here. We then get magnetic weapons, which is going to give our vector rifles plus one damage. And things are going quite well at this point, so I decide to hit the black site before too long. 
And as all things in this world must, the good times are about to come to an end. Right at the start of the mission, I'm not paying close enough attention, and I send one of the Reapers, Old Man Raven, through a window, breaking his concealment. Luckily, he didn't activate a pod, but we've still wasted his concealment, and of course, now that our concealment is broken, the assassin decides to drop in. At the exact same time, we get surrounded by two pods at once. So yeah, you can probably tell how this one's going to go. One of the pods is a priest and a mech. We burn through two claymores and the priest annoyingly survives thanks to sustain. It does take a shot at Raven but thankfully misses. I then use Haunt to finish the priest and he, of course, blows his concealment. And now behold the sight of true terror. The second pod of the mech, Sectoid and Stun Lancer activate and the assassin attacks Haunt on the same turn. Haunt is bleeding out, and he's the one with the medikit, so no one is able to revive him. We also can't call an evac on this mission, so there is literally no way to help him. Well, RIP Haunt, we barely knew you. Now, the assassin does try to hide here, but we thankfully have target definition, so we can keep track of her as she runs away. It only takes one claymore to dispose of her, but we've still got a full pot in our hands, and one less reaper to deal with it. Advent focuses on Raven, as he's still the only one revealed, but he has full cover and thankfully takes no damage. Keeping in mind we're not even inside the main building yet, I decide to use the last Claymore. This is going to haunt us more than Haunt's ghost later in the mission. Speaking of, the mech is standing right at Haunt's body, so I'm forced to blow him up with our own Claymore. So technically, we killed this guy, not Advent. Feels bad. I place Raven back in the concealment and take a shot to finish off the mech. He misses and the mech is unharmed. Thankfully he doesn't blow his concealment. That's my job after all. Diaz is thankfully able to finish the mech and he keeps his concealment too. I decide not to attack with Outrider as she won't do enough damage to finish the Lancer or the Sectoid and we run the risk that she blows her concealment. The Sectoid then moves in and spots Diaz leaving the Stun Lancer to attack him. He only takes 2 damage and we finish off the pod with ease on the next turn. However, we've lost concealment with our entire team, but thanks to Shadow we can put a few soldiers back into concealment and push forward. We finally make it to the main building and encounter two troopers and a mech. I surround them with my troops and launch the ambush, but we just don't have enough firepower to take them all out. One trooper survives and hits Raven, but he hangs on with 2 HP. He gets his revenge on our turn, and the trooper is history. But out with the old, in with the new, as another pod of a Viper, Stun Lancer, and Mech immediately show up. Diaz comes in with an absolutely clutch critical hit and one-shots the Viper. That may very well have just saved us this mission. Raven and Bower take out the Stun Lancer. The mech survives, but I'm confident I've spread my soldiers out enough that it won't use its missiles. Oh. Oh dear. There goes Raven. He was one of our strongest soldiers too. To make matters worse, Bower isn't able to get line of sight on the mech, so we can't finish it the next turn. It fires at Diaz and sends him in the bleed out. Bower finishes off the mech, and Outrider carries Diaz to the evac zone. Thankfully we're able to get him out before he perishes. However, this leaves Bower completely alone to grab the vial and escape from Dodge. Well, luckily the evac zone is pretty close to the vial, and the madman Bower actually makes it out alive. So we complete the mission, but we've suffered a major setback. Haunt and Raven were our two highest ranked reapers. We've lost them and have no way of replacing them currently. Not to mention we've got another two soldiers who have sustained injuries. Our roster is really depleted here and I was pretty salty about it on stream. But the greatest stories always involve overcoming the odds. So I persevere. We're down, but we're not out. The next couple of missions go off relatively well. We do encounter the Warlock but only suffer one injury. And then we arrive at what is possibly my favourite XCOM 2 mission ever. Have you ever wondered what happens when you combine the Horde Sitrep, 
the Between the Eyes Resistance Command, and a Reaper with a superior autoloader. Well, wonder no more, my friends. Behold the majesty. So yeah, Outrider's kill count just went into double digits in a single turn, and she still has concealment thanks to Silent Killer. Absolutely glorious. Soon I'm ready to use the Skulljack, we've got plenty of turns left on this extraction mission, and a single pod of a Captain, Purifier, and Stun Lancer. I detonate two Claymores of them, knowing it will finish the minions, but the Captain will survive. Unless the purifier blows up too, and the whole pod gets eradicated. Darn, I didn't think of that. Okay, let's try it again. We have another retaliation mission, and Advent are now deploying Berserkers. Their high health pools are going to be a problem for our underpowered vector rifles, and we have a finite number of explosives. Thankfully, we do have multiple soldiers with shrapnel at this point. The first pod we find is a Berserker and two Mutons. We take them out easily but it takes two claymores and one blown concealment to do it. The next pod has a captain, purifier, and mech. I'll try not to blow the captain sky high this time. So we send in Diaz, who is now calling him Haunt, Haunt 2.0, I guess, and Skulljack the captain. We use remote start to one-shot the mech, but we do take out two civilians in the process. That's not great. Using another Claymore, we eliminate the Purifier as well. On the next turn, Advent show their displeasure with our conduct as we activate a Faceless, Berserker, Purifier, Stun Lancer, and the Codex that spawned in. We're able to take out the Lancer and Faceless, and we thankfully have our first Mimic Beacon by this stage. I throw it down, and something really cool happens here. See, Purifiers can't hurt the Mimic Beacon with their Flamethrower, but they will still try. So the Purifier sprays the Mimic Beacon and ends up hitting the Berserker with the flames. I love it. And the million dollar question I have is, can a Berserker attack when it's on fire? Let's find out. We mop up the Purifier and hit the Codex with a Claymore. It survives and creates a clone. We take out one of the Codex, or Codices, or Codi, I don't know. But the other appears to have gotten glitched. It's just standing in the air and we can't get line of sight, even though it seems like we should be able to. And oh yeah, that million dollar question, it turns out Berserkers can attack while they're burning. So there's 7 damage on Valkyrie, great. The Codex drops a psionic bomb on 3 of our soldiers, and this is not going well at all. We hit back and Valkyrie finishes the Codex. Outrider still has her autoloader, so she can move out of the psionic bomb's range and attack the berserker. Sadly, the other two reapers aren't as lucky, and I opt to reload with their weapons and shoot at the berserker instead of relocating to safety. I can't risk the berserker surviving and taking out Valkyrie. I figure three injured reapers is better than one dead one. Injured soldiers will recover, but if someone passes away, we have no way of recruiting more, unless we get lucky with Covert Ops. I actually didn't know how much damage the Psionic Bomb would do, as I don't think I've ever been hit by one before. And there you go, 5-6 to six damage each, but at least they're still breathing. We've got one more pod to deal with, and I can only afford to lose one more civilian, otherwise we lose the mission and the region on the strategic layer. I decide to play conservatively, figuring we can get the region back if we lose it, 
but we can't get our Reapers back if they're eliminated. The final Berserker goes for Outrider, but thankfully misses. We then unleash everything we have and take it out. Then it's just the final Faceless to deal with. Thankfully it spawns quite a distance away, and we're able to end it before it can do any damage. So we've taken three injuries, which is going to stretch our already tiny roster even thinner, but at least there were no casualties. And here a problem is really becoming apparent. I've been neglecting a lot of covert ops, as we've only got 10 soldiers, and we simply can't afford to take troops away from missions to do covert ops. Now experienced War of the Chosen players will know covert ops can be a great way to reduce avatar progress in the campaign. The avatar project is creeping up on me, and if it fills, it's game over, so I decide to do something a little bit different, perhaps. Well, different for me at least. See, another way to reduce the avatar progress is to sabotage advent facilities. Seeing as we're so low on troops right now, I send Bower, now known as Bones, in to dismantle a facility on his own. He got the black site vial alone, so surely he can do this, right? Let's find out. Now, for any other class of soldier, this would likely be a suicide run. See, stealth is actually kind of broken in XCOM 2. Once you move around too much, enemy pods will start moving in on your position even if you're concealed. So doing a whole mission in stealth was never really intended by the game developers, at least I don't think it was. But with Reaper's tiny detection radius, even if the enemy start moving in on us, we may be able to avoid them just long enough to plant the explosives and then bail. And yes, by the time we make it to the actual facility building, all the advent pods are homing in on us. We're able to reach the location to plant the X4 instead of C4, get it? But there's a spectre right on top of us. Literally, it's standing on the floor above us right over our head. I use a claymore to blow an exit in the wall, plant the explosives, and then evac out. So we've reduced the avatar progress and only lowered the will of a single soldier. Very nice. Things continue going well for quite a while. We take a few injuries here and there, but no casualties and no gigantic setbacks. I'm actually able to get beam weapons before we take on the forge mission. The avatar progress does keep increasing and it reaches one pip away from being full. So I decide now is a good time for the forge mission. I actually put blue screen rounds on Outrider for this one to deal with the sector pod that always spawns. And the main problem is still our lack of soldiers. I actually only send five troops to the forge, but I'm confident they can handle it. <laughs> the first pod is a trooper and priest. I opt for the usual strategy of two claymores, though the priest does survive. Two may seem a bit excessive, but the warlock will spawn in when we break concealment, so I'd like to stay in the shadows at least until we take out the sector pod. There's no reason to face two terrifying enemies with huge health pools at the same time if we can avoid it. And the priest here doesn't know what to do and ends up making a beeline for the turret. I thought this was pretty funny, as if he's cowering by the turret in fear while invisible enemies take pot shots at him. By this point we have the sting ability, which lets us take a shot with 0% chance of breaking concealment. The priest goes into stasis and we finish him off on the next turn. We also have the silent killer perk too, which means any kill shots won't increase our chance of breaking concealment. And your chance to break concealment starts at 0%. So yeah, it's quite a good ability to have. We do encounter a pod with an Archon and Codex, but they wander off into the distance, leaving the Sector Pod all alone. This is just what we need. And as an aside, have you ever seen how a Codex looks under target definition? This giant blob is their brain, I think. It really disturbs me. So now it's time for the Sector Pod. We've got Outrider who has Banish, which allows her to empty her entire clip into a single enemy. She also has a superior expanded magazine, shredder, and blue screen rounds. So I could talk about what happens to this poor old sector pod, but you can probably guess. Right, let's not take any chances. And if y'all want to see why Banish is so damn good, well, I'm about to show you.
Oh, only 94% chance to hit with Banish. I'm sure we'll be fine. This will be the end. Yeah, but she shreds, so <laughs> every shot it's going to lose armor. Its armor is gone. <laughs> and it actually tells you, like, down below she's got one thing left, so I know that she's going to have one extra shot. So it kind of tells you whether it'll be dead or not before before the shots actually happen. But it does break concealment. But, um, but that's okay. So yeah, so that was a combination of shred and blue screen rounds that just wrecked that thing completely. The bad news is Banish does blow concealment, but that's a small price to pay to make such a powerful enemy completely trivial. The Warlock does warp in, and no one else has Banish, so we're going to have to beat him the old-fashioned way. The Codex and Archon return, but they move right next to a car, so you can probably guess how it's going to end for them too. The Warlock spawns in some zombies, and the biggest danger here is that they'll walk into the Hidden Reapers and reveal them. It's for this reason I've moved Outrider away from the rest of the group, so she can act as bait. But getting back to the Archon and Codex for a second, if you've ever wanted to see a Shrapnel Claymore combined with Remote Start, I've got you covered. We use another Remote Start to take out one of the zombies, and Outrider finishes off the second. So four enemies down with no concealment blown. That's very nice indeed. Inside the forge itself, we encounter two sectoids and a codex. Between another claymore, silent killer, and outriders blue screen rounds, we finish them off without blowing any concealment. However, then the warlock decides to summon in more zombies. The worst case scenario comes true, as one of them walks right past Valkyrie, breaking her concealment. Taking out the zombies is no problem, and I place Valkyrie back into shadow. I leave Outrider, who still isn't concealed, at the back of the formation, so the others can move forward towards the Warlock without activating him. We lose sight on the Warlock, and in the process of trying to find him, come across a pod of a Captain, Shieldbearer, and Purifier. When we find the Warlock again, I use Sting on him, just to inflict some safe damage, and he seems to have unique dialogue when this happens, which I never knew. Then use a Sting for me, please. Oh, <laughs> he didn't like that. He did not like that at all. After taking out yet another wave of zombies with ease, I place Outrider back in the shadow, and we go on the offensive. She's the only one with a claymore left, so we want her to get in nice and close to use it, without risking activating the pod. The claymore actually causes a fire, and the warlock starts taking burning damage. I'm not sure which, if any, of his abilities are disabled when he's burning, but we'll try to take him out quickly so we don't have to find out. I start shooting, knowing I just have to risk blowing concealment. Thanks to an insane critical hit with Stalker, combined with Blood Trail, one shot does 12 damage. This actually allows us to take out the Warlock before he can attack us a single time. And what's even better, all the soldiers who broke concealment still have their Shadow Charge, so we go right back into hiding. We are out of claymores for the pod with the captain, but we do have a mimic beacon. Now, it's interesting here, as the pod was right on the other side of the door as we were fighting the warlock, but when we open it, they're nowhere to be seen. It's almost like they saw bullets flying at the warlock from a bunch of invisible soldiers and just decided to get out of dodge as fast as they could. There seems to be a bit of that going on in this mission. Eventually, we find them on the roof of the building of all places, a claymore would really be perfect right now, but we're all out. We surround them on the roof and then start shooting, and they immediately flee the roof back into the building. It took about three turns to get all my soldiers into place too. These guys are starting to annoy me, so let's annihilate them. Or not, we just don't have enough firepower since not everyone can get line of sight. The bad news is all three of the Advent Soldiers are alive for their turn. The good news is they only attack the Mimic Beacon. And what's better, the Purifier has taken cover next to a forklift that we can remote start. 
and that actually makes the difference between us being able to eliminate the pod this turn and not. So a few more shots and we're now safe. We grab the body and book it out of there, having used only 5 soldiers and taken 0 damage. We've reached the point now where our reapers are becoming really powerful. Valkyrie actually levels up from this mission, so we have our second major, and she has enough AP to get both Banish and a second Claymore, two absolutely incredible abilities. In terms of weapon mods, expanded magazines and scopes are generally what you want for reapers. It makes Banish an incredibly strong ability. Auto loaders are also really good, so you know you can always reload and use a full clip with Banish. The bad news is we immediately get hit with a guerrilla op mission, and we've got a UFO hunting us. I decide risking having my entire barracks tired for the base defense is too big a hazard, and I skip the guerrilla op. None of the dark events were too bad anyway, so we should be okay. The UFO then finds us just before we get powered armor, and just before three of our soldiers get back from a covert op. It's pretty unlucky, but I think we should be okay. I do take a full squad for this one, but our reinforcements will be limited, and by limited I mean only a single extra soldier will come to help us. This may actually be the smallest number of troops I've ever done this mission with in my dozens of playthroughs of this game. Now because we're so late into the game at this point, Advent is deploying some pretty horrific units against us. Archons and an Andromedon all have big health pools, which is going to be a problem. Now interestingly, our squad starts with concealment, but reinforcements don't. They can obviously still use their shadow ability once they're on the field. We have multiple Reapers with two Claymores now, which is going to help, and we take out the first pot of an Archon and two Vipers with ease. But the big game changer in this mission is that the relay you have to destroy has spawned in front of the building instead of behind it. This doesn't happen often, but it's great news when it does. It means we can shoot at it without having to get too close. This, in turn, will make it easier to fall back to the Avenger after we've destroyed it. I decide to leave the Andromedon and accompanying trooper alone, hoping they'll take cover next to the nearby car on their next turn. And would you look at that, that's exactly what they do. A claymore and a remote start later, and what's left of the Andromedon is easy pickings. A pair of Archons unfortunately move too close to Raven and blow a cover. Meanwhile, near the alien relay, there are two pods sitting right on top of it. Watching the footage back, I have no idea why I did this, but for some reason, I use Remote Start on one pod and a Claymore on the other to activate both of them. Really have no idea what I was thinking here, and it seems like a terrible play in retrospect. I don't know, maybe I panicked. I then continue my bad plays by wanting to use Banish on one of the Archons, but clicking on a regular shot instead. This is going really well. Thankfully I can use Banish with another Reaper and one of the Archons is gone, but with the whole map now activated, I throw down the Mimic Beacon. This works really well in leading the pods away from Valkyrie and Ghost, who are then free to focus on the alien relay safely. Valkyrie takes it out and then Ghost throws down another Mimic Beacon to keep Advent off the rest of the team. I then use Banish with Raven, and yes, this game is kind of limited with the nicknames, to take out the mech. It's definite overkill, but there's not much left on the field at this point, and this way we can eliminate it using only one unit instead of multiple. Um, okay, never mind. She misses two of her four shots, and the mech survives. So much for being overkill. We keep cleaning up Advent, and only the mech and a purifier are left, minus the Advent reinforcements that drop in. Oops, there's also a captain. I forgot about him. A couple of our units catch on fire from the Claymore Aftermath, and things are starting to get dicey. I'd really love to evac this turn, but Ghost can't reach the platform. Unless we put him back into concealment, that is. See, Reapers actually have higher mobility when they are in shadow, and with this clutch move, the entire team makes it out safely this turn. So we just won the base defense mission with only 7 soldiers. That's great news, but of course, our entire roster is now tired. We've got some soldiers coming back from their covert op in four days, so we just need to make it until then. While we're waiting, we complete powered armor research, 
and we also get a breakthrough for improved beam weapons. This will mean our rifles are going to do even more damage per shot, which is going to be really helpful. Our covert operatives thankfully return in one piece, and we can now hit the Assassin's Fortress when we want to. I think we'll be waiting a bit for that one though. Next up we have a mission to neutralize an Advent General, and it's on one of the Newfoundland map types. That mission was actually my favourite in the previous game, so I'm up for it. Anyway, things start off without issue and we clean up a couple of pods, including the General. However, because we're so late in the game, Advent are now deploying gatekeepers on regular missions. And by the time it arrives, we've already used almost all our Claymores on the other pods. Oh, also, we've got two pods converging on us at the same time. So things are looking pretty great right now. And as an aside, we had the show of force sit rep active here, which means only advent units are meant to spawn, not any aliens. Well, that was a massive lie, wasn't it? So I used the last claymore to do as much damage as I can, and then both pods activate. As advent scatters, they run into two of our reapers and reveal them. I decide to target some of the lesser troopers, but only take out one. I then use both Mimic Beacons and pray to Jake Solomon that none of our soldiers meet a tragic end. We do take one shot, but thankfully no more. On the next turn, I inflict some more damage on the soldiers and place all the Reapers back in a concealment, hoping this will keep them safe. Well, one of the troopers immediately flanks Raven and blows her concealment, so she's not safe. The Gatekeeper moves in and uses an AoE attack. It actually damages the two surviving advent units, which I'm fine with. It reanimates some of the troops as zombies, as well as hitting Raven for half damage, so I'm less okay with that part. However, there is a big positive to this unfortunate turn of events. Using the AoE has forced the Gatekeeper to come out of its armor. We then capitalize with Banish and Punish it. The zombies also go down with the gatekeeper, which I didn't think was meant to happen, but I'll happily take it all the same. We then easily clean up the priest on the next turn, and it's mission accomplished. So two injuries there, which isn't great, and I honestly played the mission pretty badly. I should have used banish on the gatekeeper earlier, but we survived and that's the main thing. Things continue going reasonably well. The avatar progress is requiring constant management as it's gotten so high and injuries are affecting our capacity to field full teams, but we're surviving. And we even get a covert op to recruit a new reaper, which is a huge positive. And speaking of covert ops, we get our first ambush mission of the campaign. If you want to see how easy an ambush mission is with a crew of all reapers, then please observe. Things get a bit more serious now as the Assassin has leveled up enough to be able to attack the Avenger. I decide the time is now to hit her base and take her out for good. The first pod we encounter is at the end of a dead end, so I opt to just ignore them and run back the other way. I figure there's no point engaging with pods unless we really need to, as the Reapers should be able to sneak past most of them, and doing so will save our Claymores for the final chamber. The second pod we encounter is standing next to an explosive object. 
so by now you know the drill on this one. A single Muton does survive as he's out of the blast radius. Our whole team is still concealed, so he just runs around uselessly. We then finish him off with a single Claymore. We move forward and find a pod of four Advent Soldiers, including a Stun Lancer. Now, Stalker has actually developed a fear of Stun Lancers, and if he panics here, I think he could blow his cover and ruin everything. Okay, that's good. Initially, I try to lure the pod over to an explosive, but the Advent Soldiers are so slow that I eventually give up and just run around them and head to the elevator. Now, we come upon the elevator and a pod is standing right in front of it. Hmm, whatever do we do? Well, you know what else is right in front of the elevator? An explosive container. We remote start the pod as always, but they don't actually scatter. They just stand there like they're not even phased by the massive explosion that just engulfed them. So that's pretty respectable. Initially, I just wanted them to scatter and move out of our way, but their stubbornness has left us no choice. We lob a claymore and finish off everyone except the Archon, a sting and a silent killer shot later, and that pod is gone. We then head down the elevator for the final confrontation. Oh yeah, the whole team is still in concealment too. I'm really liking Reapers right now. In the main chamber, a captain and trooper are waiting for us. We blow them up with two shrapnel claymores. We then push forward and activate the assassin. Now, because we're concealed, the assassin doesn't really know what to do. And she just kind of chills out in the middle of the room. She does have the ability to teleport after each shot. So I decide not to mess around as teleporting avatars caused us all kinds of problems in the Templar run. I use Banish and it takes all of Outrider 7 shots to finish the Assassin, but finish her we do, at least temporarily. I then wanted to use Banish on the Sarcophagus too, but you actually can't, so that kind of sucks. Also, did you know that when War of the Chosen first came out, blue screen rounds actually did extra damage to the sarcophagus as if it was a mechanical enemy, but Firaxis patched this out later. Well, you know Jake, he's always got our back, making sure we suffer as much as possible. I love your work, my man. I take as many shots as I can at the sarcophagus, but we can't take it out. A codex and captain warp in, and the captain actually reveals one of our units. Outrider has blue screen rounds, so the Codex is a one-shot. I decide to use the other soldiers to shoot at the sarcophagus and just distract the captain with a mimic beacon. Once the assassin is back, we should be able to take her out in one turn, so we really want the sarcophagus down as quickly as possible. Turns out I'm one shot short and it just hangs in there. This is brutal. And the worst part is that it means another turn of reinforcements dropping in on us, Thankfully, it's just two codexes, so we should be able to deal with them easily enough. We destroy the sarcophagus and then clean up the rest of the reinforcements, and we actually get three critical hits here, which is pretty fantastic. The assassin warps in, and I think she's meant to be invisible, but she gets glitched and a tiny square follows her movement, so we know exactly where she is. Another banish later to bypass her planewalker ability, and she's down and out. I deliberately waited until we had multiple soldiers with banish before attempting this mission, and you can probably see why. It makes those high health enemies much easier to deal with. We very quickly get hit with a retaliation mission, and if you've never played a retaliation mission featuring a sector pod, I highly recommend you keep it that way. We are able to take out all the enemies, just not quickly enough, and we lose too many civilians, hence failing the mission. Now in this scenario, the game does something really weird. Check this out. So we get a supply increase from the region for defeating the enemies, but we lose contact with the region for not saving the civilians. So the region that we can't contact anymore is going to give us more supplies. Does this make zero sense to anyone else? We get a Gorilla Op, and one of the dark events is the Collectors, which causes the Chosen to always attempt to capture when they show up on the tactical layer. This would be brutal. Plus, we need to use the Skulljack on a Codex, and there's a Codex on this mission, so it seems like an obvious choice. The squad is a bit depleted, so I opt to only send five soldiers. A decision I would come to deeply regret. 
We need to recover a serum toxicity report, and we move towards the objective. We run into three pods at once. I try running away, hoping they'll follow and group together so we can blow them all up at once, but only one pod follows. The rest just won't take the bait. With only four turns left, I'm concerned about time. I decide we need to engage and start with Banish on the Sector Pod. We just destroy it in one go, and the resulting explosion harms the nearby soldiers, so we're off to a good start. We then clean up two more Advent Soldiers and throw down a Mimic Beacon, and this is where things start getting crazy. The active Captain and Shield Bearer destroy the Mimic Beacon. This leaves the Stun Lancer to attack Haunt, and we get knocked unconscious. This is terrible, and I immediately abandon my plans to Skulljack one of the Codexes. Using two Claymores, I take out a Purifier and Priest. I throw another Claymore at the Stun Lancer, but I can't actually use it because it will detonate on Haunt and destroy him. So pretty bad placement on my part. I then misclick and move Bones out of cover, so this mission is going so well. I really don't know why I didn't reload here. I guess I thought it wouldn't matter and we'd still be safe. <laughs> anyway, I shoot the Stun Lancer and it survives with 1 HP. Sometimes I really hate this game. We throw down our last Mimic Beacon and same thing happens. The Captain and Shield Bearer destroy it, leaving the Stun Lancer to attack. Bones takes a hit and loses an action point. Not great, but at least he's still conscious. And speaking of terrible, that priest I thought we finished earlier? Yeah, it actually survived in stasis. It then moves close enough to Ghost to blow his concealment, and there's a pod of two sectoids and codex who activate because of this, and because he was concealed, they get to shoot at him instead of scattering. The priest then puts Valkyrie in the stasis, so for our whole squad, we have five actions this turn. That's two and a half soldiers getting to do something. So this is sure to end brilliantly. Raven uses Banish to finish the captain, and Ghost gets his revenge on the priest. I then move with Bones, forgetting that he only has one action point so he can't attack. So I've just wasted his turn. I think I was panicking a fair bit by this stage. The Codex teleports in and hits Raven with a psionic bomb. A sectoid then mind controls her, so we can't even move her to safety. The other sectoid raises a zombie. The shield bearer activates its shield. And the stun lancer of death hits Valkyrie and knocks her unconscious as well. I'm incredibly frustrated by this point, as the AI is just getting stupidly good RNG. I decide my only chance is to put Ghost and Bones back into concealment. I'm able to finally finish off the Stun Lancer thanks to Silent Killer, but I opt not to attack with Ghost in fear of blowing his concealment. Raven is hit with the Psionic Bomb, but the Shield Bearer's shield was actually applied to her too, so she doesn't take any damage. So that's one thing that's gone right this mission, I guess. But the bad luck returns real quick, as the zombie shuffles right in a ghost and blows his concealment. The turn timer then expires, so we fail the mission and advent signals for a reinforcement drop. I think maybe we died and went to hell at some point in this campaign, because this is just unrelenting brutality. Ghost is able to take out the sectoid controlling Raven, this not only gives us control of her back, but also finishes the zombie that was right on top of Ghost. I bring the Codex down to 3 health, and then a Stun Lancer, Shield Bearer, and Priest to drop in. The surviving Sectoid hits Ghost with a Mind Spin. He takes Panic rather than Mind Control, but that's still really bad. Raven takes damage from the Codex and the remaining zombie. I hesitantly decide to abandon the mission, which is honestly something I should have done a while ago. My main worry is that Ghost is panicked and can't move this turn. Leaving him alone will surely result in his demise, but the alternative is going to involve losing the whole squad. So I opt for the lesser of two evils, Bones and Raven pick up Haunt and Valkyrie respectively, and we evac out. What fate awaits poor Ghost? Let's see. Well, he comes under tremendous fire, as you would expect. There's a psionic bomb, and he avoids two attacks in a row. The priest then goes for mind control, and it's all over. 
this is actually a better outcome than dying, as he's now just captured. There is a chance we'll be able to rescue him later, though only a small one. So anyway, this mission was really trash. We just got awful luck, and I don't think there was much I could have done differently to result in a successful mission. We soon get some much needed good news as our breakthrough research on our vector rifles completes. We'll now be dealing more damage, which we obviously need. To counteract that, we get a landed UFO mission that we can't possibly attempt since our roster is so depleted. That causes us to lose contact with a region, and I've always thought this was a silly mechanic. Like, we have a chance to steal some alien stuff, but we don't take it, and that somehow makes the resistance in the area scatter into the winds. Yeah, okay. To make matters worse, the Warlock picks up the All-Seeing ability, which reveals concealed units. This is probably the worst ability he could get for this run, since we're so reliant on stealth. Having the Warlock show up unexpectedly on a mission with this ability could be brutal, so once the squad is healed up, I decide to attack his fortress too. Surely this can't go any worse than the last mission, right? Right? Well, it takes us ages to run into any pods, but when we do, it's like an advent parade and we're the guests of honour. One Archon, three Vipers, and four Advent Soldiers blocking the path ahead of us. A Codex and three Troopers are approaching us from the other side. In a situation like this, where you're staring certain death in the face, there's only one thing to do. Grab your Claymores and pray to Jake Solomon. We use two Claymores and the Purifiers blow up, causing a third explosion. The only survivors are a priest using stasis and a viper who is out of the blast radius. She immediately moves next to Haunt and blows his cover. That activates the codex pod behind us. So yes, I was fairly salty by this point. Outrider is able to one-shot the codex with blue screen rounds. For some reason, I close the door here, blocking out two advent troopers. It's a totally pointless move, as they'll just open it again on their turn, and I have no idea why I did it. I guess it was like a psychological illusion of safety. If I can't see them, they can't see me. Well, five-year-old Drifter would be really proud of my amazing logic here. Anyway, we take out the Viper and prepare for the onslaught, as there's still four Advent soldiers alive. And watch this. Advent Man doesn't even need to open the door I closed since he can just shoot right through it. I swear, line of sight on this game sometimes is so broken. We actually get relatively lucky as only one attack connects and it's then our time to hit back. We take out one trooper and toss a mimic beacon with all the shots we've taken. Nearly the whole squad has lost concealment, but I guess the warlock would have just taken it away anyway. So it's fine. It's perfectly fine. Yep, totally fine. Nothing to worry about at all. We mop up the rest of the enemies, regroup, and head for the elevator. And it's time for the main event. I put the whole team back in a shadow in order to sneak up on the mech and stun lancer in the main chamber. Three claymores does the trick, and we're now ready to meet the man who never shuts up. Well, most of us are ready. Bones panics at the very sight of him and enters shattered state, making him totally useless this turn. I really need to do something about those negative traits that our soldiers have acquired. The main reason I haven't is just because it means taking more soldiers away from active duty, which we haven't really been able to afford to do. So we can't sneak up on the Warlock due to his all-seeing ability, but that doesn't stop us moving in with Outrider and using our Banish Shredder combo. He survives with 14 HP, that's how high his health pool is at this point. I then use Banish with Stalker, he doesn't have any expanded magazine, so he only has 3 shots. But 2 is enough to do the job and we start unloading on the sarcophagus. Poor Haunt catches fire from the claymores he detonated, so he has to spend the turn hunkering down to put out the flames. Two codexes spawn in next, and Bones is still shattered, cowering in the fetal position. Haunt has picked up the Deadeye ability along the way, allowing a shot that does more damage at the expense of accuracy. I use it, hoping for a crit to one-shot the codex, but no luck. 
it clones, and now we have three of them to deal with. It only takes two to finish our last Mimic Beacon, and the third then jams four people's weapons with a psionic bomb. Oh, and did I mention two more codexes spawn in? I'm actually wondering if the game is throwing so many of these things at me as a hint to use the Skulljack on one of them before we all die of old age. Well, good things come to those who wait, so whatever. Bones has decided he's finally ready to join the fight again and is able to hit two codexes with his claymore. They both only have one HP left, so that's guaranteed destruction. Meanwhile, Outrider one-shots another codex. Since she has an autoloader, the psionic bomb didn't really phase her. Now Haunt has reached kernel level and actually has the Annihilate ability. It acts as an add-on to Banish. If the Reaper finishes their target with Banish, they will then use the remaining shots in their magazine to target any additional enemies in line of sight. Haunt's able to clean up three codexes himself, two of them being the ones on Bone's Claymore. We wasted a Claymore, but I can live with that. I was a little bit panicked here, so I wasn't playing my best. Raven then comes through for us with a clutch critical hit and one-shots the final codex. That means there's nothing left for Bones to do, and he has wasted a third turn in a row. But the tale of incompetence of Bones, dear viewers, is only just beginning. See, the Warlock warps back in since we couldn't destroy the sarcophagus in time. Bones undergoes another panic check due to his fear of the Chosen trait, fails again, and this time goes berserk. Well, at least the game says he does. Normally, berserk causes the soldier to attack anyone, including your own soldiers. At least I think that's how it works. But here, Bones just hides in the fetal position again. This dude has literally just failed at failing. God damn it, Bones. So things are looking pretty grim at this point as the Warlock takes up full cover. Outrider is able to shred him, but between the full cover and his low profile ability, Valkyrie has a 20% chance of hitting him. She's got six shots in the clip, so I figure with Banish she should be able to hit him at least a couple of times. Well, she ends up doing way more than that. Her first shot misses, but destroys his cover. This is literally the best case scenario, as he's now much easier to hit, and Valkyrie inflicts big damage. Stalker and Haunt then score with crits, before Raven finishes him off. However, that used up our whole turn, so it's time for alien reinforcements. This time we get a codex, of course, and a captain just to spice it up a bit. Outrider thankfully one-shots the Codex again, and I actually then focus on the Sarcophagus. We really need to destroy it, as we can't keep dealing with reinforcements. The Warlock returns, though thankfully only with 50% health. The Captain hits Haunt through full cover. Even worse, there's an active Dark Event giving Advent stiletto rounds. This means Haunt has been hit with bleeding damage as well. He has 1 HP left, and he'll lose it at the start of the next turn, potentially causing his demise. So we need to finish this mission this turn, let's do it. I use our last Claymore to partially destroy the Warlock's cover, and then let loose with all the gunfire we can muster. It comes down to a banish with Raven. Her chance to hit is only 22%, but she has 5 shots and we only need to land 1. So statistically, she should be able to do it. And yes, on the third shot, the Warlock goes down and Haunt's life is saved. Excellent. So that definitely went worse than the Assassin, but only one injury is a price I'm happy to pay. However, the good times quickly end as the Avatar project immediately fills. I repeat the one-man army trick and send in Shadow, the low-level new guy, into an advent facility. Surely this will end well, right? Well, surprisingly it does. He plants the X4 and blows the facility sky high without issue. I think you'll fit in just fine, new guy. And speaking of new guys, we get another covert op to give us another reaper. Our ranks are now almost back up to what we started with.
Also, in the space of two minutes, Bradford goes from chastising me for sending troops on covert ops because we don't have enough healthy soldiers to send on missions, to then chastising me for leaving the resistance ring empty and not completing any covert ops. This man is completely out of control. But then the time comes. An extract VIP mission. And who's the VIP, you ask? Yes, that's right. Ghost, our fallen brother. It's time to finally bring him in from the cold. And hope he isn't still mind-controlled, because that would suck. I load up with six of our best soldiers, as we can't afford to lose this one. So we spawn in, and immediately see a pod standing on the evac zone. Well, that bodes well for this mission, doesn't it? After the first turn, the hunter spawns in... Now everyone except Ghost is concealed, and Ghost only has 5 health, so we need to keep him safe because one shot from the hunter's rifle will probably end him. And I have to say here, I really like how the hunter showed up. It's almost like he used Ghost as bait to draw out our best soldiers and then ambush us. A nice little touch to the story. Now, in some good news, we get to try out Homing Mine for the first time. It lets you stick your claymore to an enemy, and it detonates when you shoot the enemy. It's nice, as it lets you deal a little more damage on the primary target when you trigger the explosion, and combining it with two claymores adds even more damage. With the pod turned to dust, we push forward, we make it to the evac zone without incident, and by the time we do, the pod has moved away from it. So that's very thoughtful of those advent kill teams to just let us waltz out of here. Now, the hunter really hasn't done anything here. I'm not sure if his AI was broken because the whole squad was concealed, but either way, I'll take it. Ghost evacs out and activates some pods while he sprints through. I finish off a mech just because I can, before evacing the rest of the team. Well, this went much better than Ghost's previous mission. And we now officially are back up to 12 Reapers, the same number that we started the campaign with. Our good fortune continues as we get a breakthrough research to buff our vector rifle damage output. That will come in very handy. Also, Ghost had the Skulljack when he was captured, and now we've got him back, we get the item back too. So that means he had it with him this entire time, and had to hide it somewhere while he was captured, and... Oh. Oh my. I won't ask, buddy. And with the Skulljack back, what better time to try and Skulljack a Codex? So when the opportunity arises, we redeploy Ghost with the Skulljack. This is another VIP rescue mission, and there's a pod with a purifier standing right next to the truck housing the captive. We activate the pod with Sting to draw them away, as we don't want the purifier blowing up the truck and hurting the civilian when we take it out. Well, our plan backfires as the pod just stands there uselessly after it activates. It's only gunfire raining down upon you, no need to take cover or anything, right? On Advance turn, the purifier does move away from the truck, but then runs right back to where it was. Epic troll. I decide I'll try to open the truck door and move the VIP out of the blast radius. Well, that's not going to happen, as there's a sector pod there that will activate if I hack the truck door. After watching its allies fall and losing half its health, the purifier finally decides to start running for their life. I think I'm ready for the sector pod on the next turn, so I hack the door and prepare for the fun. Banish plus shredder plus blue screen rounds is as OP as ever, and the sector pod goes down with ease. The difference is Outrider now has Annihilate too, and so takes out the heavy mech, and does half damage to the purifier in the pod. The purifier also took cover by a car, so a remote start later, and he's out of here. I then turn my attention to the original purifier, and we finally finish it. After all that, it doesn't even explode, but it's still better to be safe than sorry. 
With the danger gone, we evac the VIP out, and then it's just us and a pod of three codexes. The codexes are minding their own business inside a building, and Advent has called in reinforcements. I decide to wait a turn to deal with the reinforcements before we engage the codexes. We want to be able to give all our focus to the avatar. We mop up the reinforcements with ease and turn our attention back to the codexes. Ghost then connects with the Skulljack, and it's big bad avatar time. Bones has Banish, so the avatar exits just as quickly as it entered. Well, that was certainly a lot easier than the Templar run. The two codexes survive, I use both Mimic Beacons and then easily finish them off on the next turn. We then evac out after a highly successful mission. It was a little tense at the end, as Outrider had to sprint into the evac zone with one turn remaining. I did consider taking a detour with her to pick up the loot the codex dropped, so I'm glad I decided against that since she would have been left behind. And between the Skulljack and a Sabotage Covert Op, we've brought the Avatar project from almost full back to half. This takes a lot of pressure off. Things continue going well, and thanks to another retaliation mission, we now have three Mimic Beacons. Before long, it's time to hit the Hunter and gift him the same fate as his siblings. Now, interestingly, we've never actually faced him in combat in this run. The only time he showed up, we ran away like the sneaky little creepers that we are. The first pod is a group of four codexes, which we promptly turn to Ash, thanks to a couple of claymores. I get a little lost here, and we run around in circles for a bit. Once I've worked out where to go, I think, we encounter a pod of all Advent soldiers. A combination of remote start and a claymore wipes them from the face of the earth. I'm playing a lot more aggressively with the pods this time, as I don't want to get surrounded like we did with the Warlock. We avoid the pod in the elevator room and head into the main chamber. The minions in there don't pose as much problem at this point, and it's time for the first and last dance with the hunter. He charges right at Raven and gets literally one square away from revealing her. I'll take that RNG gods. And it's the usual drill of Banish plus Shred from Outrider. She's a true monster in this campaign. She alone takes out the hunter before he can do a thing, and we then start blasting the sarcophagus. The reinforcements this time are a chrysalid and a captain. Haunt uses Deadeye to one-shot the chrysalid, and I then focus on the sarcophagus. As our rifles are now doing more damage, we're actually able to destroy it this turn. We throw down a Mimic Beacon to distract the Captain, and now we just have to take out the Hunter, who has a measly 25% of his HP. And it's almost like he has given up, as he doesn't even stand in cover. Needless to say, he's quickly disposed of. So that's the Hunter done and dusted, and he literally did not attack us one single time this entire campaign. This guy needs his smack talking license revoked immediately. Now after this mission, I realise all our soldiers have had their negative traits removed. I didn't do this and I have no idea how it occurred. I guess they just heal by themselves after enough time passes? I never knew that was a thing. But there you go, that's the good thing about these runs, you're always learning new stuff about the game. Anyway, the Avatar project is built back up again, lingering around like a bad smell, so I decide to hit the Gatekeeper mission, even though we've been fighting Gatekeepers for ages at this point. And the best part is that because the Hunter has been wiped out, he won't be showing his face on this mission. Now, this mission is incredibly annoying for these types of single soldier runs. Chrysalids hide in the ground and ambush you, even if you're concealed. They can poison your soldiers, which can cause real problems. I normally send a ranger with Blade Master, Blade Storm, and the Assassin's Sword. The Assassin's Blade is a guaranteed kill against Chrysalids, so you watch them literally just run into their deaths. But no luck here, since we can't use rangers. So instead, my strategy is twofold. Load up a couple of Reapers with Battle Scanners to draw the Chrysalids out. And two, try to memorize where the chrysalid's burrowing when the game initially shows me. My strategy turns out to be an immediate disaster. A pod of a mech, priest, and trooper lures me into a chrysalid ambush, and Valkyrie immediately gets poisoned. I use Banish plus Annihilate combo with Haunt here, 
and something kind of interesting happens. He takes out the mech and then targets the priest. The priest goes into stasis when it gets to 1 HP, and Haunt stops shooting despite having two shots left in his clip. I guess Annihilate only moves on to the next target when the current target is dead, and because Haunt couldn't kill the priest, he just stopped shooting instead. So there you go, we've learned something else in this challenge run. Speaking of, something interesting happens again. We clean up the whole pod minus the priest. It uses stasis on Valkyrie. So I'm interested to see, will Valkyrie keep taking poison damage when she's in stasis? However, we need to deal with one thing at a time. We end the priest, but Ghost gets ambushed by another chrysalid. Thankfully, this one misses with its attack. We then take it out and Valkyrie comes out of stasis. And no, no poison damage while she's sustained. That's good to know. I did pack a single medikit, so we use that on Valkyrie. Now apparently the medikit is supposed to heal chrysalid poison, but I've found it to be hit or miss as to whether it actually does. Thankfully this time it works and Valkyrie is back in the fight. Otherwise I would have just had to evac her out as she won't take poison damage on the Sky Ranger. So I move forward and try to be more careful this time. And by being more careful, I mean throwing out battle scanners like they're candy. We unearth a chrysalid and take it out. We then uncover a second one but can't get in a range to finish it. I didn't really think that one through. I should have waited until next turn to use the battle scanner. Anyway, it walks off into the dark of the night and we pursue. Once it has line of sight on Ghost, it charges him, but thankfully it misses as well. Ghost is getting really lucky on this mission. We move towards the gate, but not so close as to activate the gatekeeper. I take a shot at a pod of chrysalids to draw them towards us, and they surely take the bait. We mow them down and then draw out the gatekeeper. There's still a chrysalid lurking about too. A banish from Outrider makes a joke out of the gatekeeper and the remaining chrysalid, and it's mission success. Alright, it's now time for the final assault. I spend literally all the ability points we have in the pool to maximize our soldier's power, and then we head off to meet our maker. We don't have the intel for all the options for the network tower mission, but we can take an extra soldier and we get squad targeting, which should be more than enough for nine enemies. We deploy the team with a frost bomb and mimic beacon, and away we go. We have picked up a dark event, which increases the enemy's detection radius for stealth units, which isn't great, but this mission is still trivial. Between Claymore, Sting, and Silent Killer, we dismantle the first two pods in our path, one of which contains an Andromedon without breaking concealment. Gonzalez, who hasn't been featured much in this run, uses Annihilate plus Banish on a pair of Archons to take down that pod as well. This breaks her concealment, but we just use Shadow on the next turn like nothing happened. Now just as I'm getting cocky, Ghost stumbles into a pod on the roof and is revealed. Thankfully I brought a Mimic Beacon for this exact scenario. One of the Codexes in the pod still gets to attack and hits us with a Psionic Bomb. It doesn't really phase us, as Gonzalez has an autoloader. We move our soldiers to safety and then throw a Claymore with Ghost. Gonzalez then uses her free reload and detonates the explosive container with remote start. The blast radius is mammoth and the roof gets destroyed from under the aliens as well. This happened right above Stalker at the console, so imagine he has all these alien bodies literally falling on top of him as he's trying to hack the objective. After the annoyingly unskippable cutscene, it's time for the final mission. I use a different team for the final mission. We've got three Mimic Beacons, one set of blue screen rounds, and 12 Claymores, all with shrapnel. I wouldn't want to be Advent on this mission. I'm just saying. Now, as in all these runs, the Commander's Avatar does accompany us on the mission. There's no way we can prevent that, but we're not allowed to use it in combat. We also have to keep it on the back line so it doesn't absorb any alien fire. Basically, he's just there to spectate. Now, the really cool part about this is being concealed on this mission. It's a true game changer. 
The first pod in and two claymores plus one sting sees the first pod turn to dust. But we are now down to ten claymores. The next pod is much scarier with a gatekeeper and a swarm of chrysalids. Two more claymores. We're now down to eight in rapid time. Take care of the chrysalids. The gatekeeper still has a fair chunk of health, but its armor is thankfully gone. We use one more sting and then bones with dead eye to take it out. We still haven't lost any concealment, so that's pretty good. The next pod of all sectoids is obliterated with a single claymore, so that's down to seven. But the next pod is quite nasty indeed. Two heavy mechs and another four regular mechs. I use another two claymores and now we're down to five. We're burning through these things much faster than I would like. I really should have just shot the sectoids, but we can't change the past. The two heavy mechs do survive the blast and one runs right past Valkyrie revealing her. I was afraid of this happening, but it's not a major problem. The mechs only have two health left, so we finish them easily, and I use Shadow on Valkyrie. A pot of Stun Lancers is next, and we use one more Claymore, so now we're down to four. The Stun Lancers all survive with a smidgen of HP, and we mop them up easily. And of course, thanks to Silent Killer, we all stay concealed. One more Claymore damages two Mutons and an Archon. We now only have two Claymores left. And I'm really hoping I don't end up regretting that. Now one of the Mutons runs in the Outrider and reveals her, but I'm not worried about it. Bones finishes the Archon with Deadeye, and we then mop up the Mutons. Should only be a pod with a Sector pod left, if my calculations are correct. I put Outrider back in the shadow, and we push forward. And it turns out my calculations were actually wrong. There's not a Sector pod left. There's two Sector pods left. Yep, one pod with two sector pods and two heavy mechs. I have seen this before, but it never gets any less terrifying. So now, for the first time this mission, I opt not to go with the Claymore Strat, and instead use the Banish plus Shredder plus Blue Screen plus Annihilate Strat. Do your thing, Outrider. So yeah, two sector pods gone with one banish. Outrider is the undisputed MVP of this run. We then finish off the remaining mechs, and it's into the final chamber. Things have gone really well up to this point, but the lack of claymores could end up being a problem for us. We move up on the first avatar pod with everyone except Outrider, as she has permanently lost her concealment after using banish. And speaking of banish... Haunt uses it against the Avatar and obliterates it. He takes out one of the Archons to low health too. We finish off the rest of the Archons and then spread out, awaiting the inevitable onslaught. First up is a pod of Mutons and a pod of Sectoids. The Sectoids go down to a single Claymore, and now we've only got one left. The Mutons are too spread out to make a Claymore worthwhile, so we start unloading with bullets or beams. Bullet beams, I don't know, whatever. Some mutons are going down, well, one of them is. The other two we distract with the Mimic Beacon. The second avatar now warps in, and Raven can get an easy banish on it. The problem is she doesn't have Shred, so her shots will be doing three less damage each time. Now, what do we do in this situation? Well, how about we use our final claymore to combine homing mine and banish? Do you like that idea? Because I like that idea. So the avatar goes boom, and there's no need to worry about its armor anymore. I clean up the mutons from the previous turn, but Raven has been left on the other side of the room by herself. I race Valkyrie over as close as I can and throw down a mimic beacon. Now watch this. This scumbag spectre gets to create a clone of Raven and attack the Mimic Beacon. I had no idea a spectre could do both of those things in the same turn, and I'm now wondering why don't they just do that all the time. I'm guessing they're programmed not to, as it would make them too OP, but then why did they do it now? Anyway, the Mimic Beacon is gone and Valkyrie takes a hit. More mutons spawn in on Raven's side of the room, and I decide just to retreat to the other side. I'm suspecting that's where the Avatar should warp in. 
As far as I can tell, the two additional avatars always spawn on opposite sides of the room, so that can help you with setting up. A nightmare amount of aliens have come in to back up the avatar, but we ignore them all. As long as we take out the main target, the mission, and the campaign is won. Now, Outrider did get a lucky Overwatch shot on the avatar, which shredded it. This sets up nicely for Valkyrie to follow up with Banish and hopefully win the campaign. Let's see how she does. Nope, no good. After missing two shots and the avatar dodging another two to reduce damage, it survives with four HP. The avatar teleports away, but Outrider is able to get a flanking shot. She then proves her MVP status one last time and wins us the campaign. This run is over. So we've answered the question, yes, you can beat XCOM 2 War of the Chosen with only Reapers in combat. Now this was an interesting run. You can see on the victory screen there that it's April of 2036. To compare that to the Templars, it was December 2035 when we won the campaign. I think losing those two Reapers early on in the piece really slowed down our progress. Often I just didn't have enough healthy soldiers to field on missions, which did slow us down. I also didn't want to take on the more difficult story missions until we had multiple Reapers with the better abilities such as Shrapnel and Banish. This also slowed us down. But they say slow and steady wins the race and all was well in the end. Once you've got enough Reapers at major level with Banish, the game becomes extremely easy, terrible RNG aside. Well, that'll do it for me. I hope you enjoyed the video, and please leave any thoughts you have in the comments section. As always, if you want to see these challenge runs in full, I stream them all on Twitch. The link is in the description. Now, as I said at the start of the video, I'm going to be focusing on getting out content more frequently, so to this end, the next run is going to be skirmishes only. Please subscribe to the channel if you're interested in that one and any future XCOM content that I'm going to be putting out. Thanks a lot and have a great day. So we spawn in and immediately a So we spawn in and immediately a Oh f why can't I speak? Why can't I speak?